Hi, this is Wesley Bucker on Agile Software Development and how patterns and practices constitute. The screencast is part of a uh, set of screencasts which explain uh, patterns and practices and uh, especially some patterns, but this screencast is really about why we should use patterns uh, in our development. Um, so let's head over to the agenda. So we'll start with why and what Agile Software Development, where I'll explain a little bit uh, where Agile Software Development actually comes from. Why, why do we want Agile Software Development? Then we'll head over to writing solid code and the solid principles. Then we'll go to the framework design guidelines, which uh, uh, are a set of guidelines defined by Microsoft on how you would create and should create frameworks. And... Uh, all that matters. Then we go to design patterns. Uh, some of the Gang of Four patterns are explained here uh, and some practices. So things you should do when you create code, when you write code, create applications. And then I'll head over to a few real life examples to just explain uh, how these uh, solutions and these examples uh, would have been better if design patterns were actually used. So let's first start with why and what Agile Software Development is. So first of all, why Agile Software Development? There's actually very good reasons to use Agile Software Development. Um, if we think of our customers, most of the times when they require software, they, they, they just define a set of requirements, but most of the times they don't know exactly what they need. And they also don't know what capabilities exist in the platform that will be used for their new application. So what they do a lot of times, they define their requirements based on their existing systems, which uh, can result, if we, if we do follow these requirements, can result in an application that works like the old application and then in a new you know, jacket. It looks, it looks new, but it actually works exactly the same. And a lot of times the new features that are available in these new systems are just not used. Um, also, a lot of times customers, they need to be able to change their requirements and that even late in the process because uh, the, the people that actually write the requirements are not always the, the ones that know everything about the requirements. And then when we look at developers, a lot of times developers don't really know what the customers need. Okay, so they just uh, come up with solutions they think the customer need. Uh, and they do that because they just start to interpret these requirements based on their experience and a lot of developers are not that experienced as a uh, office worker. Another very important thing for developers is that they must deliver working software. So uh, the results of all this is that developers start to create working software. They think that that is the software that the customer needs based on the requirements that the uh, customer created that the developer started to uh, interpret it and then uh, as a result we have an application that just does some what like the previous application did or the previous solution did if we look at the results in the Netherlands uh, this means that the Dutch government loses four up to five billions of euros every year so that's 1,500 euros per second and a total of around 300 euros per resident every year over and over again. So uh, we need to do something different and that's where Agile comes in. Agile Software Development, uh, it is a software development group uh, that based the development methods on an iterative and incremental uh, development strategy. These requirements and solutions keep evolving through collaboration between self-organizing and cross-functional team and teams and this collaboration uh, allows the application or the solution to actually grow and evolve on the fly, on the go. So this promotes adaptive planning and uh, evolutionary development and delivery.
Uh, this all is, however, in a time box iterative approach. So every two weeks, for example, you just deliver a new working set of functionality. This encourages rapid and flexible response to change. And this change allows our customers to indeed uh, look at the application, see if they like it, and if they see something they don't like, they can make a change. And uh, so Agile Software Development is just a conceptual framework, but it promotes uh, tight iteration throughout the whole development cycle. So where uh, in uh, uh, previous ways of defining software we would first take like half a year to, to specify all these requirements and make these requirements very specific and then start developing for another half a year and then after you after a year you got a, a delivery and if it's not what it was supposed to be then you just have a set of non-working software where agile software development continues to evolve the application through short iterations and that uh, that is to make sure that what you do deliver is actually that what the customer had in mind. So that's agile software development. So uh, it was a group of very smart people and they came together a long time ago in a lodge somewhere in America and they defined the agile manifesto. And the manifesto defines what agile software development actually means. And it means that they say individuals and interactions are more important than processes and tools. Working software is more important than comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration is a lot more important than contract negotiation. And responding to change is more important than following a plan. So, like I said, continuously more important, these items on the right, so processing tools, documentation, contract ne negotiation, and following a plan is important. The items on the left, however, are more important. So let's, uh, uh, that's, that's a small part on uh, uh, Agile, what Agile means, why we use Agile, why it's there. So let's have a look at something else, something a little bit different, writing solid code, what it means. When we look at solid code, solid is actually an acronym, and this acronym is built out of uh, a couple of principles, five principles. So uh, we have the single responsibility principle, the open closed principle, the Liskov substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. Okay, these are all development principles, how you write code. So when we look at single responsibility principle, this means that a class should have only a single responsibility. So uh, you will not write a class that does, uh, for example, validate input and start a workflow. No, you have a workflow manager that starts workflows and you have a validation engine that validates input. Uh, this is to make sure that only one potential change in the software specification will be able to affect the specification of a single class. Okay, that's the single responsibility principle. Then the open close principle. Software should be open for extension, but close to modification. This means that a class should not be changed once a uh, uh, software when once software is delivered once it's in a final version you should not uh, have to change these classes that are defined in this version you should however be able to make modifications by extension so that means that you can change a class by building an extension for the class but the class and the software are closed for modification themselves the Liskov substitution principle. This means that objects in a program should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of that program. This means that if your class requires, for example, a, a data connection or a data table, uh, it should also work with an extended data table. 
okay so without having to change your code your code can continue to work with a class that inherits from the class that you expected that's the substitution principle you can just swap types as long as it's a subtype we have the interface segregation principle this means that no client should be forced to depend on methods it does not use what does this mean this means that if you define an interface with like a hundred methods and for your actual implementation of that interface you would only need like to define five methods you would have a hard time because you would have to specify these hundred methods because they are defined in the interface so it's a lot better to have many client specific small interfaces than one general purpose, very large interface. Okay, classes can implement multiple interfaces. So if you do have a class that can implement more interfaces without indeed uh, getting too many responsibilities, when we head back to the single responsibility uh, principle for that, uh, that is a lot better than having one very large interface and a class that has to implement all these methods that are defined in the interface. That's the interface segregation principle. And then we go to the dependency inversion principle. It's that high level modules should not depend on low level modules. So they both should depend on abstractions. Actually, your uh, modules should not have a uh, direct dependency up the chain, but down the chain. Exception, abstractions should also not depend on details, but the details should depend on abstractions only. So that are the five principles for uh, solid code, writing solid code. Every time you design an application or a class diagram, you should think about these five principles. When you do, your code will be a lot more maintainable because every class has a single responsibility. If something changes, all you need to do, if a specification changes, you need to change just one class. And that class has just one responsibility. So your code will be more maintainable. If you use the open-close principle, your code will be more extensible. It will allow you to make extensions, write extensions to your code. Um, it will be more reusable because all classes, all objects just have a single responsibility. We can reuse those classes uh, in another project where we have a need for an object with that same responsibility. And your code will be a lot more testable because you do not have dependencies that are up the chain. So you can just write uh, with a dependency inversion, you can just inject another testing object to your code. So enable uh, to, to be able to respond to changes that occur in agile projects, all of the above are required. So your code must indeed be uh, extensible and reusable, but also very maintainable because these clients, they come up with new requirements like every iteration, every two or three weeks, and your code must be uh, testable because if you make these changes you want your code indeed you want to test your code to see if you do not have any regression errors so uh, uh, that's why you need to adhere to these five principles so the framework design guidelines the framework design guidelines are uh, defined in a book by Mr. Christoph Schwalina and Brad Abrams. Uh, it's a book called the Framework Design Guidelines, uh, Conventions, Idioms, Patterns and Reusable.net Libraries. These guidelines can also be found at the MSDN site. The whole goal of the Framework Design Guidelines is to aid library designers to ensure API consistency and ease of use by providing a unified programming model. This unified programming model is also used in the .NET framework. So if your code adheres to these design guidelines, it will be it will look and uh, behave and work a lot like the .NET framework, which allows experienced .NET framework developers to easily adapt to your library and use your library. So uh, if you do write classes and components that extend the .NET framework, please do follow these guidelines. Because 
An inconsistent library, of course, uh, adversely affects developer productivity and discourages adoption. Okay, because if you do use a lot of different class names or method names, uh, you really uh, make it very difficult for developers to use your code. So if you create a specific type of button and instead of an on-click event, you create a on-fire event, it might be very difficult for developers that want to start user framework to actually find the correct events to attach their event handler to. So the design guidelines are there for .NET library extensions. So what's described in these guidelines, a lot of stuff. First of all, naming guidelines. So this provides guidelines for naming assemblies, namespaces, types, and members in class libraries. So an interface name always starts with a capital I. Okay, we, uh, buttons have a click event, not a fire event. Um, they have a, uh, for example, for events, they have a on uh, clicking or on clicked. Okay, so the one is before event and we have an after event. The type design guidelines, uh, they are also described and they, they provide guidelines for using static and abstract classes, interfaces, enumeration structures and other types. So when do you use a class? When do you use a struct? When do you create a static class? Then we have the member design guidelines, when to use properties, how to use properties, what are the naming conventions for these properties, what are the default values of these properties. So a Boolean parameter, but also a property, but default should be set to false. So if you, uh, for example, create an object that has a state which can be changed, you will not provide a property is clean because is clean will by default when you have the new object handed to you will always be true so you create a property called is dirty and by default it is set to true and when you make changes to the object it will change its value to uh, sorry to false and it will change its value to true constructors overloads fields events also operators for example operators uh, you should also always create operators synchronously, which means that if you add a plus operator, an addition, you will also have a minus operator. If you have a multiplying operator, you will also create a divider operator. And designing for extensibility is about subclassing virtual members, virtual members, overridable, uh, protected members, uh, how to use callbacks, uh, that's in there as well. Let's go to the second page. Exceptions, exception handling. How do you throw exceptions? When do you catch exceptions? Uh, it is very important. Most of the times frameworks, by the way, do not catch their exceptions unless they can actually do something with it. Usage guidelines. Uh, which types do you use for uh, common types, so to use array, attributes, collections, and how do you overload, uh, for example, equality operators? Do you overload equality operators? A lot of times when I see frameworks and I see classes, they do not overload the equality operator, which means that equality is based on the reference. But sometimes, let's say for a, a hotel reservation, and the reference might not be the one that is uh, applicable for equality, but for hotel reservations, a reservation ID is much more uh, logical as an equality operator. If my hotel reservation one object has the same reservation ID as my second object, which also uh, uh, has this, this reservation ID, then I should consider these reservations as equal. And also some common design patterns, dependency properties, and uh, the, for example, the dispose pattern, which is very common in the .NET framework. If you do write code that aligns with these frameworks design guidelines, it is much more likely that the resulting code will indeed adhere to the solid principles as well. And also your code will be a lot more readable and understandable by anyone that is familiar with the .NET framework. So 
the conclusion is that to be able to work in a development team and agile projects, really all of the above are required. Your code must be maintainable, uh, extensible, reusable, testable, but also readable and understandable to make sure that the code that you deliver is indeed uh, susceptible to change. Now let's go to design patterns. So what is a design pattern? A design pattern is actually a reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem within a given context in software design. That's a nice Wikipedia statement, um, but it is uh, clear that a lot of times when we develop something, we develop a solution, we, we come across the same problems within uh, our solution. And we can, of course, reinvent the wheel and write uh, a piece of software that is indeed uh, adheres to these, these solid policies and also adheres to the framework design guidelines. And we can just create something and uh, do a test and see, see if everything indeed is applied. But a lot of times we come across the same problems. So why not define a pattern to solve these problems? in a way that indeed the solid design principles are applied and the framework design guidelines. So in that way, we do not have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. But there are 23 basic design patterns defined by the Gang of Four. What's the Gang of Four? Well, the Gang of Four are four uh, guys, very smart guys, that uh, one day came together and decided to write a book on these design patterns. Uh, unfortunately, one of the Gang of Four is uh, already has passed away, but there's still three left. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and they, they wrote this book and it was uh, released in somewhere around uh, 1994 and it is still in the first release sold today. The reason that, it's, uh, that it never saw a second release is not because uh, they didn't want to release a second release but there was nothing that actually changed so much in software development that a uh, second release would add any value. So they still have this. We still have these same patterns used nowadays, and a lot of the patterns that uh, came after it are based on these patterns. So these twenty twenty three are just basic design patterns, and almost all new patterns nowadays are built on top of those design patterns. So these design patterns are divided by three categories. So we have the creational patterns. Uh, we have structural patterns and we have behavioral patterns. The creational patterns, they create object, objects, okay? And they create objects in a way that they indeed adhere to the design principles, solid design principles. We have the structural, defines structures on how to uh, create trees, for example, and structure your code in a way that it is uh, adheres to the solid design principles. And we have the behavioral patterns which define how your uh, classes should behave and cooperate with other classes. So just as an example, uh, a singleton uh, ensures that a class only has one instance and provides a global point of access to it. So what you see here is a UML diagram of a singleton. Another thing, a proxy. A proxy provides a circular placeholder for another object to control access to it. And most of the times, a proxy also adds some extra features. So uh, you see the UML design diagram uh, uh, over here. And we have a subject. And instead of calling the subject directly, you put something in the middle, which is called a proxy. Okay, and this proxy has exactly the same methods as the subject and the proxy forwards all the requests to the subject. But in the meanwhile, a proxy could, for example, add logging to the, uh, to the whole process or it can add authentication to the process or uh, uh, do some other extra stuff. It can extend, that's where extensibility, uh, comes uh, the subject uh, 
uh, the, the way it acts, it behaves. Chain of responsibility. It uh, avoids coupling a sender of a request to its receiver, and it will give more than one object a chance to handle the request. And the chain, if you chain the receiving objects, and you can you, you can then pass along a request, uh, the, you can pass along the chain until an other object handles it. And this can be seen, for example, in an HTTP module. If you have IIS, a .NET application running in there, the W3P process, you will notice that in your web.config that you have a lot of HTTP model, modules uh, registered. So each request that does come in at IIS will be passed along all these modules that are there. And each and every module will then look, okay, do I have to do something with this request? So you have an authentication module, which will just look, okay, is this user uh, uh, identified already? If it does not have an identity, okay, we then forward the user to uh, a login page. We have a, st a static file uh, module, which will make sure that if your request comes in and you're uh, uh, authenticated, Okay, and you have a static file, you will just go to the file system, fetch the file and return a response. You have modules, for example, within SharePoint that uh, make sure that if you request a so-called static file, uh, that verifies that it is indeed a static file in the file system or that it is uh, resides in a database. It resides in a database, it will return the value from there. So, and in that way, when a request comes in, this request passes all these modules and all these modules that just look and see what they can do with this request. It's the same with event receivers. Okay, we have an event on a class, we can register multiple event receivers. Uh, also, for example, with SharePoint event receivers, we can add an event receiver and when an item changed in SharePoint, we have an SP list item event receiver defined. When an item changes, it will call all these registered event receivers one by one. So this is that's the chain of responsibility for that uh, re, uh, change. So the result of using design patterns, uh, first of all, it assists in writing solid code. Okay, because if you use a standard pattern, you can be sure that this pattern uh, conforms uh, to these design principles. It prevents reinventing the wheel. A lot of these problems that we see in our application development, all these challenges, yeah, they are not new. It, it are a lot, a lot of more of the same. So we can reuse these patterns. Uh, because of that, it really, really speeds up development. So instead of you thinking about how to dispose objects and what to do, you can just r write uh, the, the standard pattern for uh, disposing and reuse that. Especially if you use patterns a lot, you will know them by heart and you can just really start typing. Um, it allows other users to understand your design. If you use the naming guidelines that come with these patterns, it will be a lot easier for other people to know what you do, other developers. When they look at your code, when they try to make changes to your code, if you use the standard patterns, they know what and where to change. On the other hand, if you, you do understand design patterns and the developer that created the solution for you, uh, use those patterns. It will be easier for you. It will be easier for you to understand this design of the others. So to deliver a working solution within a team of developers on every sprint, all of the above are required. So that's why to use design patterns. So some practices. What do I mean with practices? Patterns and practices. Well, if, if you want to be a good developer, there's a lot of things you need to do. And the most important thing, I think, is that you should think first and then do. Then the second most important thing is that you should really think first and then do. And that also uh, comes, uh, is built in when you start to use patterns. So you look at your problem, you look at your challenge, and then you decide which pattern is best to solve that problem. Okay, so really think first, then do. Then you should follow these framework design guidelines. It is very important because if you do follow these framework design guidelines, your naming conventions will be uh, 
uh, understandable and also predictable. Use existing patterns where possible. Okay, don't make up new uh, patterns yourself. Look what's out there. Look at the gang of 423 patterns, but also uh, new patterns, the disposable pattern, but also, for example, the repository pattern or the unit of work pattern, because there are more patterns than just the gang of four. You should actually design your code. I prefer to use pen and paper, but you can also use Visio or Visual Studio Class Designer. There is no need to start typing. Okay, you can first design your code, design your classes, design your class diagram. And when you have that, you should spend some extra time on naming conventions. Make sure that naming is consistent throughout your application or framework. Don't uh, change the names of the same properties or properties that have the same meaning on different objects. Then test your code. Make sure that your code works, that it is testable. Uh, if you do test your code yourself, you have to make sure that your code is testable. And th that in turn uh, will uh, make sure that your code adheres to these solid principles. If you cannot find a way to test your code, your code is probably not well written. Other thing is a good practice, write secure code. It is very difficult to write secure code. There are a lot of books around secure code, but you should apply stride, which means that inside your code, when you design your code, you should look for spoofing, tempering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and or elevation of privileges. Okay, make sure that your code is built to uh, resist those threats. Another thing, think about logging and error handling. It is too often that I see code that has not built in any logging or error handling. So even if you test your code and it works fine on your machine and your tests run fine, how would you solve issues that you have in production if you did not build in any logging or decent error handling? And there are a lot more. So that's what I mean with practices. What's the result of following these practices? That your code will indeed will be maintainable, extensible, reusable, testable, debuggable, secure, and most important, understandable. And this allows for much faster development while maintaining decent quality. So if we look at solid framework design guidelines, patterns and practices, if you combine those all, this is what really allows for agile development. If you miss any of those, you cannot uh, develop in an agile way. If your code is not maintainable or extendable, you'll have very uh, much issues when your customer says, well, I need an extra field over there, or nah, the workflow needs to start a little bit later. Okay, if it's not testable, you cannot ensure that what you uh, delivered last week is actually going to work when you do add that field. So uh, just make sure there's a reason for these principles and make sure you use these principles and use these patterns and use these practices. So um, just as a conclusion to the end of this presentation, uh, some real life examples, uh, things I encountered during my work and why I was not that happy with the developers who build it. So uh, first of all, for understanding code, uh, a real-life example is look at the uh, .NET framework. So if you see a membership provider or a profile provider or a claims provider, it allows me to understand what's going on. A membership provider will be an abstract class that I need to implement if I create my own membership provider. And it allows me to uh, define how users are authenticated. Profile provider is an abstract class which I need to implement if I want to add profiles or store profiles in a different location. A claims provider, say, same thing. HTTP context current, SP context current. There we have the singleton pattern. We have the DB provider factories, DB provider factory, the SQL DB connection, and only DB connection, and a SQL data adapter. Uh, 
Well, the name implies already that it is an abstract factory we are talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Trace, we have listeners, an event log, trace listener, a text writer, trace listener. We're, here we see the chain of responsibility. These listeners are uh, the chain uh, and uh, the event log trace listener is just one item in the chain. The text writer trace listener is one item in the chain. So when I write to my trace, it will go through this chain of responsibility and uh, give everybody a notification that I did a write to the trace. XMLWrite.create, it's a factory method. It will create an XML writer. So uh, the system.web.ui.webcontrols, this web controls, it's, it's the naming convention already implies what's in there. SP item event receiver on edit and on adding. The naming convention here makes sure that I understand that on edit is after the item is added and on adding is before the item is added. Which also means that if I have on adding, most of the times you will always use, will also have a cancel uh, property on the properties that are the event arcs that are passed to on adding so in that way when something has not yet occurred i can in my event handler set the property to cancel is equals true and when it equals true i can be sure that the item will not be added and in that way also on edit will not be called so, if we look at a real-life example, just by uh, knowing these patterns and adhering to these conventions and uh, policies, we, we make sure that code is understandable. I understand the .NET framework because it adheres to these patterns and practices. So let's uh, go to a real life example on a newsreader web part. I had a uh, indeed a colleague and a user that the story defines a newsreader web part that displays news from an RSS feed. So the easiest way I could just can think of to create this web part is creating a single web part with a feed URL and an item count. And then inside the web part I have code that unload, it will get the feed URL, uh, use uh, as send an HTTP request, uh, get the items, uh, have some way to render this HTML out of that and then uh, filter it on item count. Uh, that's the easiest way to create this newsreader web part, and indeed you could do it like this. Unfortunately, this web part does have too many responsibilities. If we look at the solid design principles, we see that this web part needs to get the data, fetch the data, uh, display the data, but also store properties. Because of that, it is also uh, very difficult to test or extend um, Let's say, for example, if we want to add a new news source, let's say we do not have, a, have an RSS feed news source, but we have a, a SQL news source. Or what if we would like to fetch data from multiple RSS feeds? If I could just enter one RSS feed URL, it would be very difficult to uh, get this, uh, uh, this information from more feeds. So it's testable, more extensible. Uh, because there comes a change in the user story, the customer also likes to display atom feeds as well and be able to choose a different view. Bad design in the first place requires us to change this web part and of course this goes against the open close principle of solid design. This web part was delivered, uh, maybe other uh, developers used your web part as a base class for other classes for their own web part. Uh, and now your uh, their code will fail because you need to change your uh, public API. So what you could do then, of course, is this newsreader web part in the design below, uh, uh, what you see here, this new design, this can of course uh, display multiple feed. We add a, a type property feed type uh, and we add a way to uh, set the display template. <coughs> However, the, uh, we still have the same problems. If we need uh, multiple feeds or yet another feed type or a different URL type or something like that, or we need extra display templates, it will be very difficult to make changes. Okay. 
So this is a bad design. You should not design your web part like that. And trust me, I've seen a lot of these type of web parts. So what you should do is create a design which is something like this. You create a newsreader web part, and this web part has a couple of properties. It has a provided type, a connection string, and maybe or not a display template. This display template, for example, could also be uh, defined as a template provider. But let's stick to this uh, uh, way uh, for now. Uh, if you have a newsreader web part on the top left that indeed has this provided type, you can uh, make sure that you select this provider type in some ways. So how do you do that? You create a abstract factory, and that's the news providers factory. And this news providers factory, based on a provider type, which is just a string, will return you a news provider factory. Okay, and this news provider factory has some methods to, for example, uh, create a news adapter. And this news provider factory is, of course, an abstract class. But if we get the news, uh, if we call the news provider factories to fetch us a news provider factory, it return an implementation of this abstract news provider factory class. So if the provider type is RSS news provider factory then the news provider factories will look at the registered news provider factories. It will find the RSS news provider factory and the RSS news provider factory will then be returned. And this RSS news provider factory has a create news adapter which uses the connection string. And this news adapter will then have a uh, several methods like for example, fill and get. The reason we have these abstract classes on the left side is that our web part will never know that it actually uses an RSS feed or an Atom feed. No, it will just get calls the news provider factories to get the correct news provider factory and the news provider factory will then return a correct news adapter. The web part will only know of these abstract classes. And because of that, you can just add another news provider factory. So if you would now like to make changes to our code and, for example, add a new source, a SQL news provider factory, the web part does not need any change. The news provider factories does not need any change, nor does the news provider factory or the news adapter. They do not need any change. All we need to do is create two new classes. We have the SQL news provider factory and the SQL news adapter. So this will, um, uh, so this previous design, uh, our code implements the solid designs principles. Mostly the only thing that does not uh, work in here is the display templates. For display templates, you should also do something else. Um, but if the customer now wants news from yet another source, we can just extend our solution by creating two new objects. Uh, for example, the SharePoint news provider factory and the SharePoint news adapter. If we do want to implement tests, we can create a test news provider factory and a test news adapter. Anyone that does know the basic design patterns or has experience with the .NET framework can understand our solution now by just looking at the class diagram and the names of these classes. By first creating this basic design, we are able to generate the code in a very short amount of time. So if we do indeed take half an hour to create this class diagram, then the rest of our code is a lot easier to write and a lot more uh, a lot less prone to errors, okay? If we think about this uh, in another sense, when we look at this design, it might uh, appear to you that, for example, a uh, SQL DB connection or a DB connection is uses the same pattern. So we can use a DB connection which can connect to, uh, for example, SQL or Oracle or some other database. My code does not mine. In my code, I just call the DB providers factories. 
then the DB provider factory returns a DB provider factory, for example, the SQL DB provider factory. And if I need a connection, I will ask the SQL DB provider factory to create me a connection. And in that way, I will get a SQL connection. If I ask the Oracle DB provider factory, I will get an Oracle connection. So this design looks a lot like the SQL provider factory's design. And because of that, because I know this pattern, it was a little, very easy for me to come up with this design. It's just standard pattern for me. So let's go to another sample. Uh, Client information. The user story defines a web part that displays and allows for editing client information from Microsoft CRM. And uh, in this case, the initial thought was to fetch the data through BCS in order to be able to also display external list. This is, by the way, a real life example. So my colleague created a client information web part which calls BCS and uh, BCS then in turn calls a web service proxy. Okay. Issues with this design. The web part again has too many responsibilities. It is there to get the data and display the data, but also store properties. This is testable nor extensible. Okay, this web part is calling BCS directly. So BCS is not uh, it relies on reflection, it's not type safe in any way, uh, and this web part has a direct dependency on it. So what if BCS doesn't work? The progressive insight in this project was that BCF could not deliver enough performance to display this external list. These lists were too large and it took too much time to actually fetch the data. So the client also did not actually need these external lists. And the web part rendered way too slow. So we had a design where the web part used BCS to display external list. Um, uh, sorry, to display this information. Unfortunately, the client says, oh, I'm sorry, it's too slow and we don't need external list anyway. Uh, and the web part rendered very, very slow. Mm, not that good design. So if it was designed something like this, it would be a very different story. <coughs> Excuse me. So what if we would just create a client ID filter web part? And this client ID filter web part does nothing but getting input for uh, to filter. And this client ID filter web part will just uh, allow you to uh, input a client ID. We also have a client information web part with a client ID property, which of course can be connected to the client ID filter web part. Then we design a interface, a client information repository interface. And this interface has a get client information, get client information by ID, and some other crud methods like uh, edit client, uh, delete client, update client, all that kind of stuff. If we have a I client information repository, and uh, we have some classes on the right, the client information and a client information list, we can then create a BCS client information repository, which indeed implements this iClient information repository. If the code would be started out like this, we could very easily swap the client information repository in our code. So we can have the web part, the web part will still be the same. Okay, it just depends on an iClient information repository to return client information, a client information list. And then we create an implementation of this repository by creating a BCS client information repository. If that doesn't work, instead of writing the whole web part uh, anew, we just create a new client information repository, for example, a WCF client information repository. As you can see in the previous slide, where we just have these same methods, get client, get client information by ID, and these other CRUD methods, this WCF client information repository does have exactly the same method because it, of course, implements the exact same interface. By just creating this WCF client information repository, which uh, of course will use a client information proxy to get its information through web services, our web part and the displaying and the editing functionality will all be exactly the same, does not need any changes. 
Uh, and, but instead of using w, uh, BCS, we can now use WCF, which would be a lot faster. Or if indeed WCF would still not be fast enough, CRM has the notion of views and you, can, you are actually allowed to get the data from the CRM databases directly. So if WCF was still too slow, it would not perform, it would not be the way we would like to connect for one or other reason, we would also be able to just create another client information repository, the SQL client information repository, which has these same methods that are defined in the iClient information repository interface, but then fetches the data directly from the database. Our client ID filter web part will not be changed, your client information web part is not changed, your client information and your information list are not changed. <coughs> so if we would have created the web part uh, correct in the first place, it would be very easy to make changes and use another repository for our data. Unfortunately, my colleague didn't, so all we could do is make improvements to the BCS, the, the way we call BCS, unfortunately. So the conclusion for this presentation is that agile development is really a farce if the code is not designed with the patterns and practices in mind. You cannot make changes to the code, you cannot test your changes if your code is not designed in the correct way. So if you cannot make changes, it is just a lie if you tell your customer that it is allowed to make changes even late in the process because we do agile development. If you want to be a good developer, you need to know the basic patterns and these framework design guidelines. It allows you to do development much faster in a much better way. For me, must reads the framework design guidelines by Crystal Svalina uh, and Brett Abrams, the design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software by the Gang of Four, uh, the book Writing Secure Code, which uh, defines how you do uh, analytics on your uh, analysis on your code and define threats and how you mitigate those threats. And uh, another one is Code Complete, the second edition. So that's it for now. Please enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Bye bye.